Hey, you. Thanks for tapping into Untapped Keg podcast, where we go into different perspectives of sobriety and mental health, where we believe there's only one right way to get to sobriety, and that's a way that works for you. Hopefully, you can take something from the show and implement it into your own life. And if not, you'll learn something pretty cool along the way. I'm RJ Zimmerman, and I have the honor and privilege of being joined today by Logan Cohen, who is a proud family man to both human and fur babies, as well as a practicing marriage and family therapist, an approved supervisor with the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy, and a level two clinical certified trauma professional. He has a counseling practice in Charlotte, North Carolina with multiple practitioners, and is also a published author in 2021 with the book, How to Hew Man Up in Modern Society, Heal Yourself and Save the World. Thanks for being here. Logan, how are you doing today? Doing great. Appreciate Thanks for having me. For people who don't know, you are a content creator as well as a therapist. And you have been on, I found you first on TikTok. And now I cool. follow your Instagram as well. What was it that kind of drew you to start talking, creating the videos that you do? Yeah. Um, so in, in large part, I started creating content in order to have a platform for supporting the book that I wrote. It was really just kind of practical and functional. Mm -hmm. And in doing it, um, I was realizing that the content that I was creating was resonating with a lot of people. Um, so I just started kind of running with it. You know, the whole kind of, if, if it's working, you know, work, whatever is working. Um, and I saw that there was really a void of folks talking about the prevalence of what I just kind of colloquially or, or generally refer to as little T traumas. Mm -hmm. These kind of smaller, you know, so-called smaller experiences that as kids or in, in relationships that we don't think as um, being scarring for us emotionally or psychologically or mentally speaking. Um, and, and so not many people talking about this, and especially as a man, um, I figured I could kind of kill two birds with one stone, both provide all this information that seemed to be missing and give people, leave people with a different taste in their mouth about what else might be behind the, the, the shaved dude with the shaved, you know, bald head with the bearded guy that they're just assuming is some other misogynistic jerk. Oh God. I, I usually say that like, yep, I get that a lot. It, it is definitely a stereotype and I get, you got to protect yourself. Right. Um, sure. I, like a lot of what you create, it resonates with me and my journey. And, you know, a year ago really went into a deep well of um, embracing my feelings because, yeah. you know, I've been, I haven't drank in almost 10 years. And so nice. it was six years into not drinking where it was like, I really went into my mental health. And that was where I learned the connection between mental health and escapism because I stopped drinking, but then I went into work, went into relationship, you know, video games with friends, back to work, father. I kept putting things into other buckets and those were my identities. And that, then I realized when my marriage was starting to end, okay, who's RJ then? And yeah. I yeah, we, couldn't we answer that question, right? <laughs> we don't get a lot of room for it, especially yeah. as, as dudes where there's so much pressure to align ourselves and our identity with, um, you know, how we provide or how, how tough we appear, kind of how, how good of a protector we might look like. Um, and you know, this is age old themes used to be called hunter warrior. Um, and whether we're in a male meat suit or not, you know, when, when we're getting sober, uh, you know, the, the, the gateway drug isn't, you know, weed or even alcohol. It's, 
it's it's trauma is it's it because it leaves us chronically dysregulated while also not knowing how to relate to other people so there's when we realize that we can just mash this button that releases dopamine and turns off our feelings it's like oh my gosh like i'm I'm never giving this up like how could i you know, can't imagine life without it and you know hear a version of, of what you just shared rj like all the time it's I'm sober for a while and i lost myself and or tried to like really dig in in some of these areas and then i realized i don't really know who i am besides someone who does these things and what do i do with all these feelings and what are they again and it's it's can be pretty disorienting at first oh absolutely is and it's it's something that as i've really dug into this journey and been on this podcast talking to so many people understanding that it's not about um, it's like we, when we stop drinking, right. When we look at our escapisms, when we look at addiction, sobriety, that is the cause of our struggles is our addictions and our escapism. But really when it comes to mental health, that's really a symptom of something yeah. underlying. Right. So now as yeah. you understand it's a symptom, you can be more compassionate and give yourself the grace to, it's not going to be right away. And that goes a long way. And so, you know, as you talk about these, the traumas, even the little T ones that add up. And as you said, we don't give it a lot of credence to that. When you start to work on your mental health, it actually helps you with your escapist the tendencies as well. Absolutely. We, you know, there's, there's this, uh, there's a whole Narnia's closet of human experiences that is just waiting on all of us to engage in. And, and you, you can't step into your light and own your space um, unless you can be present in your body. They're just totally contraindicative. God, I love how you just said that too, um, being present in your body. Because uh, so uh, coming up on four years ago, I was diagnosed with ADHD finally. And started to learn about like dissociation and masking. And I did not understand what dissociation was, but I did it. Like is that a snap of the fingers? I wasn't there anymore. And yeah. now as I'm starting to understand that, and as I went through being present in my body and Trevor Noah was the first one I heard say it, where you become comfortable in the chaos and you are so uncomfortable in the peace and the calm that you'll create chaos to get to comfort again. So learning how to be in your body and allow it to come down is something that it, it is a practice for sure. And it's scary. And, you know, can you talk a little bit about coming into your body and how your nervous system, you know, can really keep you revved up? For a long, long time, long time. Sure, sure. Um, one of my favorite old sayings that I like to to relate to this is really about meditation. It is, is that the 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 real practice isn't on the pillow; it's it's in life, and it and it really is as simple as meditation. As if if anyone is listening has has practiced this, you know where. The, the goal is to suspend thought and suspend judgment. And every time you catch yourself starting to ruminate on something or your mind wondering, it's bringing yourself back to this suspended judgment state, back to center. And that's really what a practice of self-regulation comes down to is learning to recognize when we're getting wound up in fight or flight or we're getting tuned out or shamed and feeling small in freeze and having compassion for it and then either upregulating ourselves or downregulating ourselves back into what science calls a parasympathetic state which is just rest recovery and digest it is the most natural state um 
may I reframe that really the most natural state for humans to be in since we're pretty neurotic primates is probably dysregulated but it, it is the most most healthy state for humans to be in is this centered grounded rest cover digest it's it's where you can actually access all the nutrients that are in your gut it is where you have enough blood flow to your brain and your frontal cortex to uh, have um, complete use of your executive processing skills. As you know, with, with addiction, go or one of the first things to go offline when you're in craving. Um, it's this very kind of like reptilian brain experience that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, having some practices that we can use uh, whether it's a part of our daily routine or a weekly routine that keeps us regulated and keeps our, it's called window of tolerance as wide as possible so that when we do run into turbulence or do have high waves that we can, you know, bring ourselves back to center as efficiently as possible. Um, well, also if you have a regular routine, you can go like, okay, well, Usually when I do this, I can sink into it this efficiently. I'm really having a hard time doing that right now. So what the heck is going on with me? And having you have some other indicators, kind of like uh, uh, lights on, on your on the gauge of your car that would go off that say, hey, check your oil pressure or, hey, your you know, your washer fluid is low or, or, or whatever. It, humans process information so quickly and so egocentrically and like automatically um, and categorize everything as good or bad or right or wrong, that we tend to not be, be very attuned to that information unless you or we, we each have a way of checking the dipstick very regularly. Yeah, that's really, as a, you know, I think men and people who are self-sufficient, like checking that dipstick regularly, that's something that we can all understand and work with. And one of my indicators that I've noticed is um, that I can use, especially being raised as a man, is my temper. So my anger. If I have a short fuse, that tells me, okay, I need to take some time, whether it's 10 minutes at lunch, whether it's I can take a break here or tonight I need to take a second. What happened during the day that is sticking with me? And then I can classify that anger. Is it just anger? Am I pissed off? Have I been offended? Did somebody do something or am I annoyed about something? Am I annoyed about something that's, uh, that happened in the morning? Am I frustrated by how things are going right now? And when I name that, it helps me to embrace it. And then that just lets it move on. Right. And I don't stay yeah. in that short temper area. And yeah. I think that's just an example that people can use, especially when you're really starting to understand your body. And it feels woo woo at first, right? It like that's so I worked on my mind for two years. And then I was like, you know what? My body's not where I want it to be. I don't know my body that well, really. I want to work on my mind body connection. So I started yoga, kung fu, tai chi. And all of those things over the past years helped me to understand when I'm feeling something's off. I can feel the part of my body that feels off. And that helps me to find a different emotion. It helps me to find a different, oh, this happened, this sticking with me. And sure. that helps me work through it. And, you know, I just want to explain to people that that is something that you can get to. And I'm talking to you as somebody who was a black hole for most of their life when it came to all of this, that it is possible. And it's, oh, absolutely. it's actually fun when you get there. <laughs> it's, a, it's a learned skill. And it's, it's an acquired taste at first, especially mm. you know, when we grow up in a, a civilization where socially and culturally emotional restriction is so idealized. Um, we're taught to be ashamed of or scared of our emotions as like a, a, a macro reaction to even having them. So they're like buried under all these layers of crap. Mm -hmm. um, and once you learn to, as you said, you know, the, the, the opposite of of uh, um, of of hate or you know self loathing is is love and it comes to, to compassion. So you can start having compassion for yourself and compassion for those experiences. It will cut through that social and cultural conditioning. It's not about giving yourself a pass to be a 
a punk or weak or or a sissy or dependent or anything like that it's about honoring your humanity so you can just like figure out what's going on and, and get on with it but I, like i think a lot of uh, men you know especially you'll hear about like mind muscle connection or like being in the gym you're like okay like when i get in the gym, like these are my the cues for my deadlift and this is how i like pull my armpits back and get my lats tight and do all that stuff like you learn to do that it's not natural you have to read about it you have to practice it you have to put it through experience and you see what works and what doesn't it's called proprioception this is this the science word for it you can also do this with your mind it's called interoception is having a meta awareness of where and how you feel things and once you practice this enough you start going like oh like i'm i'm angry what am I angry about? Am I blocked from a goal? Am I actually ashamed of something and I'm trying to puff up? Am I scared of something and trying to make myself look impermeable? You know, like what's what's going on? And you learn to either integrate that intuitive wisdom and regulate yourself or talk to your loved ones around you to participate in some co-regulation to cool down or make sure your tribe's got your back or, you know, wh whatever. But it, it, they are learned skills and, you know, it, it's sometimes an acquired taste getting to them. That was, yeah, that was, that was a really great explanation and it was a lot to digest. Um, you know, it's funny you said interoception and I knew exactly what you're talking about because my Kung Fu instructor, my Sifu, he talks about doing it with our forms, like the interoception. So it made me chuckle inside a little bit. I just wanted to, I just wanted to name that. Um, awesome. as people are like understanding their bodies. They want to come to a better understanding of what they're feeling, how they can move through that and start to heal things. Right. The, I think the best way honestly to start is therapy. One thing that, and I mean, uh, just starting, I guess is the best one, right? Just start something, but sure. therapy is generally a really good one. Is there any, um, tips or ways to go out find go about finding a therapist that you can give people because for myself yeah. when i looked for a therapist it was who has the first opening and i learned that's not necessarily the best route to go so don't do that yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um treat it like dating God, treat it like one. dating just like you know, to obviously take the sexuality and lust out of it. Um, go on several first dates and don't get too attached to someone in the first meeting. Go have a series of experiences, um, hear what people are about, see who you resonate with, see who you feel comfortable with. Um, there, there's always going to be, you know, people have certifications and different scopes and areas of practice that you can read about, you know, take it even further. You can read about uh, what folks will share about their personal stories. And I often find that the more folks share about their personal story and relate it to why they do what they do, generally the more authentic and real they're going to be with you in the room too. Um, sometimes that's not even a good enough gauge because sometimes it's, it's also just about this like intangible chemistry that is either there or it's not. And you won't know how moving and, 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 and cool that can be, how alchemizing that can be until you get on that date and you're sitting across from someone being like, dang like you get me this is cool i'm super interested in you too but you know um yeah whether you think about it as dating or, or starting to look at houses if you're like trying to buy a house and you're just like okay <laughs> i'm not getting too attached to anything we're just looking and having experiences and seeing what i vibe with and going from there that's so valuable because i got my therapist that's my therapist it was kind of how i thought about it and then my friend, uh, Waba, who's a mental health streamer on Twitch, they go, uh, no, you can shop for therapists. And I'm like, what are you talking yeah. about? 
No, like if you're not vibing with them, it's okay to say this isn't working out and move on. So you saying dating and going on first dates, like that's knowledge that people, because we haven't talked about mental health for so long and that's been in the background, right? That that's something that people don't necessarily understand or it's not something you even think about is something you can do. It's more like, kind of like with doctors where we really probably should shop around for doctors too, but we don't. We're like, you have the degree, you tell me forgetting that C's get degrees, but you know, that's another. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> me too. In some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, as, as, as you find we are more open and you said earlier about, um, somebody being open about their story and relating that and talking about our experiences with mental health. What have been some of the benefits that you've seen, um, across, honestly, across the board, just life in general, or people coming in to, uh, be, uh, patients or, you know, is there uh, some benefits that you've seen from that? Yeah. Um, well, the first one that comes to mind, I mean, you, so you can either wait for pain to compound so much that it completely puts you on your butt where you can't function at all. And then, and then try to get moving from that. And, and you'll have a lot of reasons to, but you know, the laws of physics, like your, your momentum is going to be slow because you know, object at rest is going to want to stay at rest. Yeah. If you can recognize some things that you know are not working, that you tend to do repeatedly and out of habit, go ahead and try to sink your teeth into that. I think so, so many people just wait for a midlife crisis in, in like you know, already like mid existential crisis to, to deal with something. Um, I see people tapering off of like kind of minimizing medication, even getting rid of it entirely, um, really deepening um, interpersonal relationships with loved ones, um, having leaps and bounds of growth in their professional work, um, developing a much deeper spiritual connection, um, and, and you know, being much more attuned to, to their purpose and, and intentional about, about daily life and what it's all about, being less scared of death. Um, I mean, the, 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 I really see pretty profound things happening um, with, with clients in talk therapy on a, on a very regular basis. And and a lot of times people hear stuff like that, like it either sounds woo woo or you're going like, yeah, but I've been, you know, in the bottom of a handle of Jim Beam for 20 years. And like, I'm so numb that I couldn't even imagine. Okay. Well now, now, you know, too, and you can't unknow that, that that's a problem. You can keep trying to drink it into, into not knowing, but, but you know, and imagine on the other side how much more meat there is on the bone like if, if you're that lost and numb and what, what you just heard me describe sounds woo woo and almost too rich and dynamic to be true try me bro hmm. like not necessarily like me like whoever like go yeah what do you have to lose <laughs> you know like, right how much worse can it get get called out on your crap like come on <laughs> you're bigger than that <laughs> <laughs> that's when i saw my healing and my growth like increase exponentially was when i was like what if i'm wrong what's the worst that's gonna happen if i if i try this and i end up being right i go back to doing it how i did but what if i'm wrong and i take that willingness to be wrong and i just say fuck it let's try it see what happens throw it against the wall and realizing that like it's been a superpower yeah let's be wrong and eventually it turned into curiosity right but 
it didn't start there. It started with a, if I'm wrong, okay, guess what? I don't know. I just don't know because I have yeah. no idea and I don't like where I'm at right now. So let's try something different. It becomes a <laughs> gift. You know, the Buddhism calls it beginner's mindset, you know, like the, the faster if, if, if human beings inherently process information with this egocentric mindset constantly. So the faster we can be humble to what we don't know, the faster and more efficiently we can grow and learn. And w- once you learn to lean into that curiosity and unknowing, bro, sis, Zay, it's the inflection point is is incredible it really is and what i've seen it do too is like take me back to my creativity and i didn't realize how much i had missed that um but like i don't like how i define and this is something that i feel is really important too is vocabulary and how you define words come up with your own definition for words that you like so my creativity is taking two seemingly unrelated subjects and finding the bridge between them, finding how they can relate to one another, right? I really enjoy doing that. And there's a lot of people that do that with life because it turns out that a lot of life lessons work across everything. It's just a matter of how you can relate to it, find that context. And that when you find that creativity, when you find that passion, it's just like, you just have a smile on your face that's more genuine. And we're all creators. Yeah, yes. that's just kind of something that humans do. We we are dynamic group problem solving machines, and who? Yeah, at some level, like who who are you to whoever's listening to to keep yourself from us? Like we're we're all supposed to be doing this together, and that's like we're the, that's what brought us out of the trees and in the grasslands. That that's why we hunt the suckers that were taking us out one on one, and hunt the suckers that hunt the suckers that were taking us out one on one. You know, like chimpanzee one on one is and literally take your arms, rip it off of your torso. We create tools, we create language, we create dynamic systems of hunting, of storytelling, of solving problems in, in nature rewards, biodiversity. It's just part of the Gaia principle. It's part of how all the systems of mother earth come together and and coexist. So if, if you don't know how you create yet or what you create or how you empower your fellow uh, man or woman, like come, come to the dance and we're, we're waiting. And there's this moment where you stop trying to impress people because you're your authentic self. And that is powerful all on its own because you stop like with my ADHD, I was, I masked really hard my life. So like I, I didn't even realize I was doing it because I didn't understand ADHD That's another topic, but learning who I am, I don't mask across situations anymore. Like, who I am as a father is the same person that I am as, you know, here talking to you on the podcast as a friend, as you know, who I am in a relationship. It's all extremely the same. It's just, you know, there's little things like I'm not going to be extreme and I do drop F bonds from my kids, but not as much. Right. But like, I also pull back for what they can handle and you know, my humor is similar with my kids as they are. It is a cross. And it's just when you can do that, you stop putting so much energy into, oh, this is who I have to be right here. This is who I have to be right here. This is who I have to be right here. It takes so much energy to track all the personas. <laughs> right? It takes so, so much energy so and it much. creates so much cognitive dissonance. You know, oh, yes. like if, Im, imagine where you in a world where you trust yourself to be yourself and you know that you deserve to be there and that you add something valuable and your people love you for it. Like mm-hmm. that's that that's what everybody has to gain 
from 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 being willing to to go on on their own hero's journey you know whether that is in psychotherapy whether that's in positions of servant leadership doing community service whether you know many different ways to do it um but it is uh it, it is having this like sniper like focus about who you are even if we have some executive processing issues <laughs> we're not like second guessing how we do what we do and why we do it and who we are when we're there and it gives you an understanding of yourself so like when i come across when i used to come across something that i wasn't very good at i would be so hard on myself right why can't you do that? Why is that easy for somebody else? Like they can do it. And it most of the time it's something detail oriented. Listen, if it's like minute details, give it to somebody else. All right. But if it's, you know, when you hit chaos, when shit hits the fan, call me in because I'm going to be the one, <laughs> but I have that understanding now where it's going to take me longer if something has some tiny details in it. So that's okay. I'm not going to get mad at myself anymore. Or I might screw something up. I'm not going to be mad at myself. I'll be like, could have made a different decision. Could have done better. We know better for next time. And it's just allowed me to, with this understanding of myself, make my life work with me instead of trying to make me fit into life completely. And that just yeah. didn't work for so long. So like at, as you start to learn yourself, this understanding comes and then the compassion and then the grace and then the so much more. Yeah, no, you, you said it, man. You said it. Um, so with all the talking about mental health and embracing it as a culture like we are, and I think it's, it is, I don't think, I know for a fact it's worldwide, right? Are there some, some things that you've been a little bit like, mm, we need to pull back on that a little bit. Like it's getting a little bit too far out there. There might be some drawbacks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what, one area that stands out is a lot of, the, specifically a lot of use of word. Uh, and this is coming Ooh. from, history of uh specializing in domestic abuse and domestic violence with uh couples and families and really being in the weeds on it is like uh, i don't know two or three years ago maybe there started being a lot more focus on the the fact that there can be abuse happening in relationships without it being physical and the words that started to come up for describing that were uh, uh, and still are in a lot of pop psychology spaces, uh, narcissist and narcissistic abuse. And those phrases and words used in that way have no basis in evidence-based research at all. If, if you go try to look up a peer review journal about narcissistic abuse, you won't find one because they don't exist. Um, and it, it's pretty dangerous using that terminology for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, you know, some of them being, you know, as you, you mentioned earlier, we came a long way from housing folks with mental health issues or addiction in warehouses and chaining them to a bed and, and you know, like beating them with crosses or starving them and, and as a, a form of treatment or, or whatever. And that, mm -hmm. that didn't stop until like the 1940s or 50s, really. Um, so it's pretty recent, you know, especially how much we're talking about this stuff in, in, in real time in so many spaces of even, um, you know, dominant culture. So like using narcissist as a synonym for abuser, like that's, that's a personality disorder. And folks with personality disorders come by some of those issues in like a huge range of ways. And it's, it's not a synonym for abuser. And narcissistic abuse is not a synonym for mental abuse. Um, and and uh, so it, it's bad for, for mental health. It's bad for the general public. 
Uh, a lot of times for victims of abuse, it makes them uh, become obsessed with concepts of, you know, what they're, the, of anything they can get their hands on about narcissism. It almost kind of like fetishizes an interest in narcissism and creates this, well, Carl Jung calls it the shadow bearer, where it's like, okay, well, there's this other person that is the source of all the nasty nasties. So if I can just totally steer clear of people who have any of that at all, um, I'll be safe and fine and okay. But fundamentally, power and control dynamics are a part of oppressive institutions that are all throughout you know, society. And you have to learn how to protect yourself from them, from individuals, as well as on an institutional and macro level. So like, it's, it's not all, you know, it's not the, the bad guy in the bushes. It's how we're conditioned to, to put up with oppression on a lot of different levels. Um, and even like more specifically where you know, victims are just like told to go no contact generally just go to contact go to, and you know for someone in, in who's stuck in domestic violence if they hear that you know say okay well i just like need to leave there's been no lethality assessment done so if if there's a history of physical abuse you know especially folks putting their their hands around someone's throat or pointing a weapon at you or um really uh, elevated illicit substance use while the abuse is happening the chances are that you're going to get your maimed or killed when you do that extraordinarily high. There's no mention of safety planning. It is all just really short-sighted and dangerous on a lot of different levels. Um, it's something that I try to talk about when I have the opportunity to, but it takes more than a sound bite to do it. Right. And those areas have such um, an intense uh, uh, um have their minds so intensely made up about what it is and what it's not that it's a, this very dangerous echo chamber and they can turn into hate groups incredibly quickly. So like kind of dropping information around them and sound bites is like even dangerous for the person doing it. It, it is. And I've, I've honestly seen that. And this is a great segue too, where, in the sobriety spaces, in addiction spaces, when one thing that I've noticed is when you start to make your identity one thing, like one major thing, whether that is your sobriety and whether that is something else, if you don't leave room for yourself to be able to move because your things are going to change, things are going to shift, your sobriety isn't going to be front and center forever. And if it is, good for you if you're having a fun life, but also if it is, you're going to be very defensive when yeah. that is attacked. Right. So when you start to attach yourself to that identity, that thing, you get into that. Oh, I'm going to go down with this shit because this, I know this has made my life better, but is it really better? Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I would argue it's, it's not better if you're so attached to it that you cannot, humble yourself to your confirmation bias you're just just a, addicted to it's a spiritual bypass mm. you know you're like a compulsively or a, obsessively uh, uh ruminate on these other the, this other collection of, of very black and white thinking in order to keep yourself oriented to right and wrong and, and that's, 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 that definitely is not like water. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that's not a very resilient position. God, that's the way that people end up thinking too, with that, with that black and white thinking, like life is varying levels of gray, you know, and it's kind of like, as you know, Peter Venkman said in Ghostbusters too, my laundry isn't just clean or dirty. There's many subtle levels along the way. Listen, it's, it is true. Like life is gray. So when we look at things black and white, that's great when you're looking at the outside world, but is that how you want to be treated? Is that how you want to be looked at? Or do you want context to be added to why you made a decision the way that you did? And then what you're doing and the way you're moving through the world. So yeah. when you embrace that gray, you really can move through things um, with some flexibility, with some, 
some grace and see the world for what it is rather than what you wish it would be. Totally. Totally. And it, and it, it might even be a, a, a bigger conversation. What we're touching on here is kind of some of the dangers of tribalism. Um, yes. And they're, they're becoming more subtle than, you know, the na- the neighboring tribe might kill us or outcompete us for resources. So we'll starve. You know, now, now we're, we are intersecting with each other, you know, as globalization is happening and, and, and technological inter- innovation where everyone is bumping off of each other in the kitchen constantly. And we really have to relearn how to talk to each other um, you know, using nonviolent communication and how to, how to listen to each other when we don't agree or when we're heated or upset. Um, or we're, we're, we're going to take each other out before global warming does. Right. That's, a, that's a great, so I just started reading nonviolent communication this weekend, actually. So nice. <laughs> it's, it's, it's something that everybody honestly should be looking into. So there, you know, one book that I think should be taught seventh and eighth grade. And then again, in high school is Brene Brown's Atlas of the heart to be able to really talk about emotions and feelings and experiences and you can understand them. So we all have similar vocabularies and nonviolent communication, like from what I, where I'm at right now is like, that should also be one that is a textbook because it is going to help you throughout your entire life. It's all relationships, not just certain ones that you can use that. Absolutely. You know, again, human human beings are dynamic group problem solving machines, and we've gone from one billion people to eight billion people in a hundred years. If if we cannot learn to talk to people from opposing tribes very quickly, um, then it was the only the tools that we're going to have are what we relied on. As, as we, you know, developed an isolated farming communities, which is kill or be killed. Um, and I, I, I would agree with you that some of those skills really need to be taught to uh, pre-adolescence and, and, and drilled in, um, in in middle school and high school. Uh, I also have such a distrust for institutions at this point that it's hard to imagine um kind of the the elite not continuing to take advantage of encouraging one half of the poor to kill the other half it's just such an a, a effective means of social control um but it would really be nice to see <laughs> i'm only laughing to keep myself from crying because it's such truth that um that really is what has been going on for generations where you have the elite in control and they're using that's one thing that they can use and they're using it and that's where a lot of my values have kind of shifted in the past year where i was like top level change the federal government change everything and now i'm like if i can make my community better at least that's a start and we can see the ripples there and so, you know, that's, that's led me to do things that I wouldn't have done before because I had paralyzed myself with the, uh, it's not happening at the top. It's not happening period. And that's just going to people like, you know, you, we can make our local community better and that will ripple out to the effects, but it also helps your immediate vicinity now a lot quicker. Absolutely. Like if, imagine if we all did that. And like, we can't, there's, it's not going to be top down. Yeah. They have no incentive to do that. No. Um, and, and it's, it's too easy to procrastinate on making any real change and kind of, you know, like researching how we're going to make the institutions (laughs) do these things. And like, and, and, and all that research, like convincing ourselves that we're actually doing something. Why don't you do something tomorrow? 
why don't you, you know, look into how you can volunteer with big brother, big sister. Why don't you talk to the person next to you at the bus stop who you see there every day, but you don't have any meaningful conversation and start creating community and, and, and looking out for someone in a marginalized position and using whatever social location you have to make sure that, that their voice is heard. How, like, how, how do we do that every day? Just a bit. That, that is something that those small things, they add up quickly. And it's another life lesson that relates to across everything else with what we've really been talking about is these small changes, these small lessons that you can learn that add up to, you know, your nervous system being more regulated, add up to you understanding your body a lot better. It starts with one thing. And you can take that thing that you know and try to understand it better. And then that'll take you to something else. And then that'll lead to something else. And it's just like, you know, sobriety one day at a time, one day adds up. I'm damn near 10 years and it does not feel like it, but I had to be at day one. I had to be at day 90. I had to be at one year. And now I'm almost at 10 years and it's just, as you take these little steps, you can, you will look back and you'll be like, wow, I can't believe I came this far. Huh? Yeah, and, no you know, as, as we're winding this down and we're talking about people, social media, um, and how it's really helped get the message out there, but also need to be a little bit cautious when it comes to some of the clinical terms that we're just throwing around and bantying about what is what is something on social media that has allowed you to like just get hopeful get optimistic something you've seen on social media that's just been you know lighting your life a little bit Um, uh, humor memes. <laughs> I know it's like said like silly. So one one is just like humor memes. The the seeing how much playfulness is still alive on social media. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it keeps me hopeful and optimistic. I think when when play exists and people feel comfortable to show up and play. Um, they're, 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 they're not totally convinced that they're at war, you know, it's like, uh, a group of dogs hanging out with each other. If, if they're playful, then the pack is stable enough. You know, the, the first thing that goes away is play. You don't see any more play bows. No one else is rolling on their back anymore. Um, the, the playfulness brings some hope. Um, I, I really just like seeing how much more people are talking about mental health in general, um, starting to see more men talking about mental health and healthy relationships. And um, it, what it would, the only men that I would see are just like old codgers talking about being a-hole bosses and that being a boss move or or, you know, like Andrew Tate and his cronies just you know, normalizing misogyny. Mm -hmm. um, and and folks are challenging that and calling it out a bit differently. Um, and the, those are the the little uh, glimmers that I did. There's more interest in eco psychology, which I think is really cool. Um, you know, people interested in how uh can be more involved in in nature whether it's getting your feet in the soil and grounding or forest bathing is what the japanese call it or even light therapy just being like outside in in the ua uv light for a few times a day how much this impacts health um a little bit more uh, folks have seemed to have been uh, got reinvigorated about lifting and, and strength training, which I think is like great, you know, as human beings are fundamentally pretty active 
animals, like we're evolved as persistence hunters. It's it's important. Um, there, there, I think there are a lot of little areas where um, I have hope. Psychedelic assisted therapy, I think, is fascinating. Um, uh, there might be like a, a semi taboo talking about on this podcast. I'm not sure. Well, um, <laughs> I mean, there's no research that it's addictive. So that it, yeah. if you you know you're using it with science, how's it different from sure. medication? So, I mean, obviously everything on on here take it for yourself this is about your own journey and that's something that i think is important too that yeah alcohol for me was not great maybe one day i'll try something like that and does that make me not sober not in my eyes but yeah. definitely everybody's journey is unique and like that's that's okay it, it doesn't have to look like anybody else's i think that's important yeah, yeah. good good yeah, I th I th generally, I think you know those are some of the areas that um, it's it's easy to get distracted by negativity and fear mongering and shame mongering. Um, and I would encourage you, like if is, even as a creator, like if that pops up on your feed, or if you feel like I'm doing that, unfollow me. Unfollow anyone that you yes. feel like is promoting that and 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 does that for you. You know, it's a uh, feed feed your mind with what creates hope because that's that's you're going to learn to expect more and more of it and it's going to have its own synergistic effect absolutely and that's your social media feed is your feed you get to prune it and curate it so something's pissing you off time to hit that mute button at the very least for a little while right and snooze yeah. that's something that we lose sight of too well this has to come up but it doesn't since I've learned that and like the unfollow and mute and man, am I like, okay with being on social media for a little while? Cause <laughs> for a while there, it was like, I am getting mad way too much. What is going on? I don't like to be this jaded. Um, Logan, I appreciate you coming on and having this conversation with me. It's been, it's been really insightful. And for anybody who doesn't know, go to healing humanity, seven, 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 that's on Instagram and TikTok, correct? Same. And yeah. follow Logan because he takes really high level ideas and he breaks them down in a way that's understandable really quickly. And it's just, it's a lot of information that you can gather that can start you on a learning journey that it'll go a long way. Um, is there something that, you know, you'd like to leave for people as we're, wrapping this up yeah um go uh, go on your journey uh there's we, we we if you're listening to this then you speak english and which means that your civilization is very impacted by western european culture which has no coming of age ritual anymore Hmm. And there is a higher self in there that has not had the chance to breathe yet. Um, leave your little hobbit hole, go on the journey, get the elixir. Let's bring it back home. Damn. That's, that's a good one. This has been Untapped CAG, podcast where we explore different perspectives, sobriety and mental health. Marjorie Zimmerman, let's try to be better tomorrow than we were today because if we don't make it, we tried. Have a great week, everybody. I love you.